Have you ever had that feeling that you're losing control? Or, or maybe you didn't realize it, but all of a sudden something started bubbling up out of you and you recognize that it's not your hands on the steering wheel of the vehicle of your life. It's something else has gripped control of the direction that you're moving. And you don't know why or how it happened, but you know, you feel like you're on a ride that you are not in control of. If you've ever been there, if you feel like you're going there, or if you ever will go there, and I'm just going to give you a hit, all of us at some point in time will approach that, that place, then this series is for you. I think this is an incredibly important conversation that we're having. The series is called, You're Not the Boss of Me. Uh, we are in partnership with North Point Ministries, and Andy Stanley is giving this series. He is a phenomenal communicator, and I hope you enjoy it. If you missed last week, that was the first, that was the kickoff of the series. This is the second part. I would encourage you to go back and listen to that one before. Uh, they kind of build on each other and stack on each other. Uh, so it's an important conversation to have in order. Um, but here's what we want you to know, first and foremost, about Canyon's Church, that we are for the LC Valley. We are for LCV. And if you don't know why, here's the simple reason. We believe that God is for the LC Valley. We believe that God is for you. Even if you're not part of this valley, God is for you, and so are we. And we want to do whatever we can in order for you to help engage with your Heavenly Father. Maybe take that next step of faith. You know, there's about 40,000 people in our surrounding area here at Canyons uh, in the LC Valley that, that feel like they're far from God. If they were asked the question, you know, what, what religion are you a part of? They would say uh, unknown or other or none of the above. We want to engage with you. We, we believe that God is for you, that has a promise for you, that has a plan for you. And maybe you're, you know, you're unchurched or you're de-churched, you're over-churched, you've been over church for a while now. Somebody burned you along the way. We just want you to know, you're welcome here, that, that this is an open conversation that we would love to have with you, that this is a welcome place that you can show up and be comfortable to be yourself, to ask those authentic questions, and hopefully... At the end of the day, take a step towards your Heavenly Father. And that's kind of our hope for the whole, whole entire series. And uh, whenever you're watching this today, this moment, this online service today, that you would actually, at the end of it, you would take a step. You would take a step towards your loving Heavenly Father. And if, if you're not able to do that, if you're still kind of wrestling with a lot of those things, that's fine. And we're loving, we love that you're still engaging with us and watching a, uh, a message today. But we want you, we hope that you would at least, at the very, very least, at least wrestle with some questions that maybe we don't like to wrestle with or ask some questions of ourselves that, that would help us live this life better. We're going to be here about 50 minutes, and I hope you enjoy every single one of them. So we'll see you later. Enjoy the service, please. I don't know if you have ever read the results of a survey. They do these surveys every once in a while where they ask people this horrible question. They ask the question, um, what would you do if you knew you could get away with it? What would you do if you knew you could get away with it? There'd be no consequences. You're not going to get caught. Nobody's going to know. What would you do if you had like a free day or a free week? You can just do whatever you want to and there are no consequences. And if you've ever read the results of one of these surveys, the results are terrifying. They're terrifying. Uh, forget the millionaire next door. You have no idea who's living next door to you and what they would do if they thought they could get away with it. So to kind of get us all on the same page moving forward today, here's what I would like for us to do. I would like you to turn to the person next to you, preferably someone you don't know, and share what would you do if you knew you could get away with it? What would you do if you know? Don't do that. That would be right? I mean, you don't even want to know. In fact, we, we, would, we wouldn't even come back, right? Yeah, well, and the thing is, here's what we know. We kind of already know. 
Because when the external constraints are removed and when the fear of consequence is removed, do you know what happens? Our hearts are exposed. And sometimes that's a scary, scary thing, isn't it? Now, the, the cool thing, we talked about this last time, is that culture and our parents and our teachers and our common sense teach us to monitor our behavior, right? We learn how to behave. In fact, today, while I'm talking, some of you are going to stare straight ahead and think about something entirely different than what I'm talking about. You're going to daydream for the next 30 or 40 minutes, but you're going to behave. You're going to sit here and do this every once in a while, look interested, and you're going to look like you're taking notes on your phone. It's like, how long is this going to last? You're texting your friend now, okay? But, you, but you've learned to behave. We all have learned to monitor our behavior so we can get interviews and jobs and dates and second dates and even second dates with the same person. So we, we've learned to monitor our behavior. But no one taught us to monitor our hearts and our hearts as we're going to discover are part of the problem and we say when you say Andy talking about a physical heart no it's just that that internal part of us that where we keep the secrets and where we carry stuff that's really the problem and the other thing about our culture that makes this so difficult sometimes we're encouraged to follow our hearts <laughs> and when you read the results of those surveys you're like no do not follow your heart okay just ignore that song don't listen to your heart you know just don't you don't even go there unless you're an unusual person right now, Jesus addresses this, and um, it's so brilliant. It, and it's not just brilliant because what, G, what Jesus says. Part of it is so brilliant because he said it so long ago. He, he, here's what he said. He said, don't you see, talking to a group of people and some Pharisees, we talked about this last week. He said, don't you see that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and then out the body? <laughs> We're like, yes, actually, we do see this about yeah, two or three times a day. So, so what's your point? And he goes on now that he has our attention. He says, but, I mean, whatever goes in your mouth, it goes out of your body, harmless. But the things that come out of a person's mouth, not into their mouth and out of their body, the things that come out of a person's mouth, they come from the heart and these defile them. And the word defile means that they set you at odds or put you at odds with God because they put you at odds with others. Because the thing that got bothers God is what you do that bothers others and words and behavior that hurt other people. And so he says the things that defile you aren't the things that you eat. It's the things that come out of your mouth. They put you at, God, at odds with God and others. And then he says this, for, this is the kind of brilliant part. He says, for out of the heart or out of us come evil thoughts. And those thoughts ultimately are behind every murder. Those are thoughts that are behind adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. He goes on and on and on. That these are the things that defile a person. That every single one of these activities begins with a thought. Every single one of these activities begins with something inside a person. So not only should we monitor our behavior and edit our behavior, Jesus goes on to say, and as we're going to discover, it's maybe more important to monitor what's going on on the inside of us. Now this explains some things that you've experienced that I've experienced. It explains, in part, why seemingly nice people suddenly do horrific things. Out of the blue, they just, it's like, what? That he just didn't seem like he was that kind of guy. She just didn't seem like she was that kind of woman. And this, that was the last thing I expected from her. That was the last thing I expected from him. Now, if you're dating somebody, and this is a pretty serious relationship and you're moving forward, this is a really, really important um, principle. If you're dating someone and suddenly they do something or they say something that's just like, whoa. You know, they do something or say something that you think, wow, that was that was kind of out of character. And, and then they say something like, oh, I, I don't know where that came from. Well, now you do. <laughs> it came from their heart. It came right out of them. And the reason it came out of them is because that's what was in them. And you need to pay attention to that. Let me illustrate it this way. You see, if I were to begin shaking up this, ga this glass vase, if I begin to shake this, shaking this does not determine what comes out. Shaking this simply reveals what's in there. What's in here, what's in here determines what comes out of here. More importantly, would anyone on the front row like a Skittle? No, I'm just kidding. We can't, can't do that. Okay. So the point is that what's in here, this is so important, what's in here determines what comes out of here. Shaking it only reveals what was there all the time. And the same is true for you. And the same is true for me. And the same is true for that guy that you're dating and that woman that you're dating and that girl that you just met. And you, 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 whatever comes out when things get shaky, whatever comes out of a person when they get shaken, when circumstances turn and suddenly there's this uncharacteristic behavior, 
You should pay attention to that because the only thing that comes out is what's already in there. So we should follow Jesus' advice and we should follow Solomon's advice. Solomon lived many hundreds of years before Jesus. He was the king of Israel and he was considered one of the wisest people who ever lived. And he wrote a lot of things. Some of his best material is found in Proverbs, which is in the Jewish scripture and also in our New Testament Bible. And this is interesting. Solomon said, you know, I've written a lot of things, given you a lot of advice, but above everything else, above everything else I've instructed you to do, you should guard your heart. Why? Because everything you do flows out of it. Everything you do, everything you say comes out of you because something about that is already in you. What's in here is eventually going to make its way out there. We know this from experience because what was in your parents' heart spilled out on your parents and eventually spilled out on you, right? And what's in your heart will eventually, in fact, is already spilling out on the people closest to you. So this is a really, really big deal. Whether you're a Christian or non-Christian, a theist, non-theist, whatever your worldview is, you know this, you've experienced this. So wouldn't it be great to get in the habit of monitoring what's happening and going on on the inside of us before it spills out on the people that we love the most? Now, there's two, two parts of this. Guarding our hearts, guarding our hearts involves cleansing the toxins out that are already in there. We're gonna talk about that. But it also involves keeping those things out as well. So today, I want to begin with something that all of us have a little bit of inside of us. Um, Something that all of us carry because we've lived long enough to accumulate some stuff inside of us, inside of our heart. And this is going to be a good example of what we're going to talk about for the rest of this series. And this particular thing we're going to talk about sets us up to fail in our relationships. It could set you up to fail in your finances. And it could definitely set you up to fail as a parent if that's something that you're currently involved in or you hope to have be involved in in your future and that thing that I want to talk about is this word guilt guilt I'll give you a definition not because you need one but because well because I decided to give you a definition the definition of guilt is simply this it goes right to the heart of what we're talking about it's an emotion Guilt is the emotion associated with acknowledging we've done something wrong. It's the emotion that we feel when we acknowledge that, uh uh-oh, I've done something wrong. Now, there's different kinds of guilt, and one of the guilts we're not going to talk about is the guilt you feel that people feel even though they haven't done anything wrong. And if you're a highly religious person, you may carry a lot of this guilt. It's so interesting. Religious people often feel guilty they haven't even done anything wrong. They're just people who just are under a cloud of guilt. They just feel guilty all the time. In fact, depending on how you were raised, you may think that guilt is synonymous with God, or you may think guilt is synonymous with a religious experience. In fact, one of the reasons you may not like my preaching or our church is that you don't feel guilty enough, so you don't feel close to God. There are some people who just think the closer I feel to God, the the way to feel close to God is to feel guilty. Well, a lot of times that's false guilt. People live with this sense of guilt. They really haven't done anything. So we're not talking about that kind of guilt. But the other two kinds of guilt that we've all experienced are, number one, the guilt that you experience when you have done something wrong. You've actually hurt somebody or harmed, harmed somebody, and you begin to rehearse it in your mind, and maybe you've rehearsed it in your mind for so long it's kind of defined you you've so associated yourself with what you did you would maybe even label yourself and then the other kind of guilt is close to that it's the guilt that you feel when you've done something wrong but you felt so bad about what you did you've kind of buried it you've kind of removed yourself and every once in a while the past looms large somebody will remind you of something or you'll see somebody or you'll visit a place and you'll remember what happened there and it looms large and it's so overwhelming it's so overwhelming You just stuff it back down. And you, like all of us, have created a narrative. You know what I mean by a narrative? You've created a story that you tell yourself, and you've told yourself this story so many times, you genuinely believe it. And the story goes something like this. Well, I wasn't the only one, and I was only 20. I was was just a college freshman. That was my first job. Well, I had just moved to that city. Well, we didn't know any better. Well, everybody else, you've created a narrative that kind of sands the rough edges off of what you did, sands the rough edges off of how much harm you created in that person's life. And so you have this narrative, the story that you go to, and then you just kind of bury it. But here's why we're talking about it today. Denying it, denying it or being defined by it actually empowers it. Denying it kind of, I just don't want to think about that, or or defining yourself by it where you just kind of wear it all the time. Either one of those actually empowers it. And guilt 
becomes the boss of you. And guilt, specifically, throws you off balance. It causes you to walk off balance and to relate to people off balance, to parent off balance. And here's why. Because whenever you do something that hurts another person, it creates a debt to debtor relationship. This is why guilt throws us off balance. It creates a debt debtor relationship between us and ourselves and us and others. Because every wrong thing you've ever done to another person, every harmful word, every harmful deed, everything you've ever done to hurt another person intentionally or unintentionally is an act of theft. You took something from them. Maybe you took their self-esteem. Maybe you took their opportunity to grow up with their parents in the home. Maybe you took a marriage. Maybe you took a reputation. Maybe you actually took something physical. But every single time you hurt a person with your words or deeds, every single time I hurt someone with my words or deeds, I am taking something from them, which means I then owe them something. Every time you hurt somebody and create guilt, you have created a debt debtor relationship, and now you owe them. In fact, this is a new information because we actually have terminology that we all use to describe this dynamic. We say things like this, you know what? I owe her an apology. Why? Well, I did something and I took something. I didn't think about it in terms of taking something at the time, but I realize now I, there's, there's an imbalance. There's a debt debtor. I, I owe her an apology. I don't know how I can make it up to them. I realize that I owe them. I realize that I owe her, I owe him, and I feel like I need to do something, but I don't know exactly how to make it up to her or him. So we understand intuitively that when we hurt another person, that we owe them, there's a debt-debtor relationship, there is an imbalance. Guilt and sin throws our lives out of balance. But here's the tricky part. We don't experience guilt as debt. We experience guilt as weight. It's a weight that throws us out of balance. It affects our reactions. It affects our responses. It will affect your ability to be compassionate. It will affect your ability to parent correctly. Guilty parents have a tendency to overparent or they have a tendency to pull back and to underparent because they're dealing with their own guilt from things they've done and I shouldn't be so hard on him or her. After all, look at what I've done. Or in light of what I did in the past, I want to make sure he doesn't do that and she doesn't do that. So again, guilt just throws us off balance. It impacts our ability to forgive and it impacts our, our willingness to be compassionate and to give. That's why, the reason when I say it feels like a weight, that's why when you get rid of guilt, how do you feel? You feel better. You feel lighter. Again, we have terminology. We say things like, I just, I just feel like a weight has been lifted off of me because guilt is a weight. And the other thing about it being a weight is we carry it everywhere we go, don't we? See, if you developed or you picked up your, your weight of guilt in college, you, you carried it with you into that next season of life, right? You carry this weight everywhere you go. If you picked up a little guilt on a business trip, isn't it true that you brought it back to your city? Maybe you picked up a load of guilt or a weight of guilt in a previous relationship, but the truth is you brought that guilt with you into this relationship as well. And if you carry it, and if you bury it long enough, if you allow it to define you, or if you defend it, or if you try to turn your back on it without resolving it, here's the thing that really makes guilt dangerous. Eventually, eventually, guilt evolves into anger. But the problem is, and this is what makes this so difficult and so important, the anger that you feel began as anger with yourself. But anger leaks, doesn't it? Anger never stays isolated in the relationship where the anger was created. Anger is along with that weight. It goes with you from season to season, relationship to relationship. You've disappointed you. And now you find yourself constantly disappointed with the people around you, the people closest to you. Somewhere in the past, you didn't live up to your own expectations. And now, even though you haven't connected these dots, now nobody else can live up to your expectations. And the tragedy is, very rarely do guilty people ever make this connection. They experience anger, and perhaps you're experiencing anger, but the real problem isn't anger. The real problem is unresolved guilt. Unresolved guilt leaves you angry at yourself, but 
anger leaks and anger seeps into one season after the other after the other from one marriage to another marriage from one relationship to another relationship it travels with you just like the weight of guilt but most guilty people are never able to put their finger on the source of their fury because you know what happens their failures our failures disappear into the recesses of our hearts while everybody else's failures are plain to see. Is everyone adequately depressed at this point? I just want to check. I don't want to see any smiling faces out there, okay? Now, I know this is kind of heavy, right? Yeah, aren't you, aren't you glad you came? Aren't you glad you're watching? So here's the thing, though, okay? Those of us, and I'll throw myself in the bucket with all of us, okay? Those of us that refuse to face up to what we did and fully examine it and fully bring it front and center because it's so, you know, just, we just don't want to do that, or who just allow it to define us, for both, for both groups of people, this makes absolute sense why it just throws us out of balance. Because, and the reason sometimes it is so difficult to face up to fully what we did without making excuses and without telling our sad story and without blaming people is because when you face your guilt, when you face your guilt, you stand condemned. There, there's, there's no recourse. We, we, we can't undo what we did. We can't unsay what we said. You, you can't go back and unleave. You, you can't be un, unfaithful. You, you, you can't undrink too much. You can't unwork too much. You can't unplay too much. You can't undo anything too much. You can't go back and give your children the childhood they deserve. You can't go back and give her her first marriage back. You can't go back and give him his first marriage back. You, you can't go back and, and redo it. So consequently, when we face what we've done and we don't play around and we don't make up stories and we don't make up excuses, I mean, we stand condemned. So of course we want to make up a narrative. Of course we want to come up with excuses. Of course we want to reduce it to a little small story that's not all that bad, except the problem is this. Your past and my past was not designed to be left behind. Although we try, although we try not to think about it, although we try to push it in the past, your, your past isn't designed to be left behind. Your past is part of your story. Your past is a permanent part of your story. And the way you deal with guilt is not denial. And the way that you deal with guilt is not reframing the story. There's another way forward. But until you understand this third way forward, we really just have two options. We allow it to define us and carry it out loud every single day into every single relationship. Or again, we create a scenario where it wasn't that bad and we try to put it behind us. But there is a third way forward. And the reason we're talking about it today is because Jesus... Jesus offers the third way forward. Now, the person that put this into words, and I think put this into the best words, actually wasn't Jesus. It was one of his first century followers. And I want to read you what he said, but this is so important. For just a minute, especially maybe if you're coming back to faith or you're new to church, I, I don't want you to hear me reading the Bible. What I want you to hear are the words of a man who had more regret and more guilt than everybody in this room combined. You're going, Andy, you don't know what I've done. You just hang on. The person who brings this, this insight had more guilt and more grief and more regret than all of us probably combined. And yet he was the one who understood this third way forward as it relates to guilt and grief. Saul of Tarsus when he showed up on the pages of history, Saul of Tarsus showed up as someone who decided to do the work of God by arresting men and women who were followers of Jesus. He had them arrested. He had them jailed. He had them tortured. He had many of them executed. And after months and months and months of just wreaking havoc all the way around Judea and in Galilee and in the name of God, I mean, this is the worst kind of sin, in the name of God hurting other people, he discovered that he was on the wrong side of God. And he placed his faith in Jesus and he became a Jesus follower. But imagine this. From that moment forward, he had to interface with the husbands and wives of men and women he'd arrested, tortured, and had executed. From that point forward, he had to interface with the, with the fathers and the mothers of children he'd had arrested and tortured, in some cases executed. He spent the rest of his life in a community of Christians, and just about everywhere he went, he ran into people who either were or who knew people whose friends and family members he had personally had arrested, jailed, 
tortured, and in some cases executed. Men and women that were tortured to the point that they would die later of infection as a result of what he'd done. Can you imagine living with that kind of regret? Can you imagine the dreams that he had? Can you imagine the terror he would never forget in the eyes of men and women as he dragged them to Jerusalem to be tortured, to be jailed, and again, in some cases, stoned and executed because of their faith in Jesus? But instead of sanding off the rough edges of his story, And instead of allowing it to define him, when the Apostle Paul, as we know him, when the Apostle Paul met Jesus, he discovered that the significance of Jesus' death on the cross intersected directly with his guilt and with his shame. And instead of running from his story, this is amazing, he documented it. In fact, in two of the letters that he wrote that become part of the New Testament, he tells us his story. He tells us all the details, and he calls himself the least of all the apostles because of what he had done. And yet he is the one that brings us the words that point the way forward for those of us who carry guilt and are who are tempted oftentimes to allow it to define us, or because it's so overwhelming, cause us to lie about our own story. Because when the apostle Paul discovered Jesus... Here's what he discovered, and this is for you. He said, therefore, as a result of what Christ has done, as a result of God's extraordinary love for you, therefore, there is now no condemnation. There is therefore now no condemnation. Paul, you don't know what I've done. Paul would say, wait, let me tell you what I did. And here's what I've discovered. As a result of what God has done on planet earth through Jesus, there is no condemnation. In fact, there is a space, there is a place where the, don't miss this, where the actual past, where your actual past is neither forgotten nor condemning. You can face it, embrace it, because you know it can't ever be erased. And he says, when you find this place, you will be able to fully face everything you've done and yet not live as as if you are condemned. He says, and here's that place. For those who are in Christ Jesus. For those who have stepped into this new kind of relationship with God that Jesus introduced. Jesus referred to it as a new covenant, a new arrangement, a new contract between God and man. And those who are willing to face the condemning truth about themselves and acknowledge it to God and respond to the lordship or the bossship of Christ. The apostle Paul says there is a way that you can face your past, everything you've done, and not live condemned. And here's why. He says, because, here's the reason. Because through Christ, the law of the the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. Here's what that means. That you can live a life free from the shame and free from the feelings without kidding yourself. Because the law of Christ has overcome and canceled out the law of sin and death. What is the law of sin and death? The law of sin and death is simply this. That after you did what you did, you're stuck. That after you did what you did, said what you said, treated them the way you treated them, you're stuck. There's nothing you can do about it. All you can do is grovel or deny, grovel or deny, allow it to define you or just pretend like it didn't happen. You're stuck. Guilt becomes the boss of you. Shame becomes the boss of you. The past becomes the boss of you. But Paul says, as a result of what Christ has done, that law, that cause and effect law of sin and death has been canceled. For what the law, this is so powerful, for what the law was powerless to do, what the rules were powerless to do, the rules that you decided to adhere to when you got married and then you broke those rules, what those rules can't do for you. What you decided to do as a parent, I'll never and I'll always and I'll never and I'll always and I'll always be here for you. And then you broke your own rules. What those rules are powerless to do. What the state law is powerless to do. What your own personal standards are powerless to do. Because what can laws do for you? All they can do is condemn you. You said you'd never, but you did, you're condemned. You said you would always, but you didn't, you're condemned. You said you would always be there, never leave, but you aren't there anymore, and you're condemned. You said you would come through, you made promises, you broke promises, you made vows, you broke vows. You have not even lived up to your own standard. And what can the law do for you? All it can do is remind you that you have failed. 
It simply underscores your guilt. And Paul said, I understand that. Because Paul was an expert in the law of his day. And he said, but here's the good news. What the law could never do for you, God did. That God has created an avenue, God has created a place, God has created a space where you can face your future, never denying it, and live uncondemned. And how did he do it? He said he did it by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering for you. Now you've all heard, we've all heard multiple times that Jesus died on the cross for our sin. But there's more to it than that. The Apostle Paul says, when Jesus died for your sin, he not only removed the guilt of your sin, he removed the condemnation that comes with sin. Sin, The self-condemnation and the condemnation that we assume comes from God. At the cross, Jesus took what you actually deserved on himself. And what did he take on himself? He took divine condemnation, self-condemnation, all condemnation. He says, come on, you bring your guilt to me, God says, and you bring your guilt to me with eyes wide open, no excuses, don't sand off the rough edges, don't make it PG-13, no stories, no excuses, no narratives, and together we will agree that you are guilty because after all, you did break their hearts. After all, you did lie to get your way. After all, you have been irresponsible, been irresponsible with your body. After all, you knew better and you did it anyway. He said, but come on, come to me. Let's own it. Let's own it. You are guilty, but you are not condemned. In other words, God would say, when I see you, I don't see that. And I want to invite you into a life where you don't see that either. He wraps it up this way. He says, God did condemn something, but not you. He said, God condemns sin in the flesh, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us. This was his fancy way of saying that God has restored you. God has restored you in his eyes and he has given you a status of guiltless. Consequently, no longer condemned. God chooses to love you and listen to you as if it never even happened. You're guilty because you did it, but you're not condemned. Because Jesus took your condemnation for you. Now, you say, okay, okay, is this like just like a like positive thinking? I mean, is it, does this even really matter? I mean, I didn't even understand any some of those verses. You kind of went kind of quick because Paul's kind of complicated. Does this does this work? Is this a big deal? I'm telling you, this is a huge deal. This is the way forward. This is the way for some of you to begin to see yourself in a different light and for some of you to bring up the past in a way and finally deal with it instead of pretending it's not as bad as it was. There's four huge implications I want to just give you real quick. Number one, you, once you step into this new kind of relationship with God, once you fully embrace everything God has for you in Christ, number one, you actually forfeit the right to condemn yourself because you are not yours to condemn You forfeit, you actually give up the right to condemn yourself, all that self-condemnation. You lose the right to do that because when you receive what God has given you through Christ, suddenly you are not the boss of you. You do not belong to you. Paul in another letter would say it this way, you're not your own. You have been bought with a price. Therefore, your heavenly father through Christ is now the boss of you and you can't call you what he doesn't call you and you can't see you in a way he doesn't see you because you lose the right to see you the way you used to see you because your heavenly father has declared you new and forgiven and uncondemned. And when that voice of shame rises up and when those memories rise up, you say, oh yeah, I'm guilty, but I am not condemned. I have no right to condemn myself because I don't belong to me. And guilt and shame, you are not the boss of me. My heavenly father through Christ is the boss of me. And I believe about myself what he declares over me. Number two, your guilt will remind you, but it will no longer define you. This is huge. You did it, but you are not what you did. Yeah, you were there, but you are not what you did when you were there. Your past, this is so powerful, your past becomes a not so gentle reminder to look up in times of guilt and to look up in times of those memories and thank God for what he's done for you. 
In fact, um, one time Jesus was having a conversation with some people who didn't like him too much. He was actually at their home, and this lady comes in, and there's all this controversy and all this stuff. It's a powerful story. And at the end of the story, before Jesus leaves his host, his guest, his host house, who wasn't a very good host, he says, look, don't forget this. The people who are forgiven of the most, they actually have the capacity to love the most. The people who are forgiven of the most, they're actually the most grateful people. So what happens is when you step into this way of thinking with your heavenly father, your past, that in the past you've allowed maybe to define you and to remind you of everything that's wrong with you, in those moments, your past becomes a pivot point. In, a, in those moments when your shame and your grief begin to well up or bubble up, that's when you say, that's just a reminder of what God has done for me in Christ. This is why every once in a while when you're in church, maybe you're, you're kind of staring up at the screen and we're singing a song and it's not really your favorite song. You don't, you know, you're just kind of daydreaming. And you know, two people down or three people down or maybe right next to you, there's a man or a woman. And they got like one hand in the air and there are tears running down their face. And you're like, you know, what's up with that? I'll tell you what's up with that. You're next to somebody who understands what we're talking about. And suddenly when they see certain words, when they see certain phrases, when they see the word grace, when they see the word compassion, when we sing a song about God's love, they are reminded of who they used to be. They're reminded of what they used to do. They're reminded of the thing that they don't want anyone to know about. But instead of pretending like it's not there, they're saying yes. And this just reminds me of how gracious you are, what a powerful, mighty God you are, and why I am so happy to live for you. I've been forgiven of much. It is easy for me to love much, and not only you, God, but the people around me. That's freedom. That's powerful. That's life-changing. That's what you, that's what I have been invited into. Third thing is this. You forfeit the right to condemn others because that would make you a hypocrite. You forfeit the right to just size people up and write them off. This is why the greatest embarrassment of Christianity is that we've ever had a reputation of being people who size people up and write them off. Because the more aware I am of the sin in me, the less aware I should be of the sin in you. The more aware I am of my unworthiness, the less aware and the less concern I should have about your unworthiness. And how hypocritic of all of us, of any Christian who have been forgiven, to kind of somehow forget where we've been and where we've come from and condemn other people. In fact, my theory is this. Judgmental Christians have never come to grips with their own sin. Judgmental Christians have never come to grips with their own guilt. Judgmental Christians have not allowed themselves to be defined by their guilt, but they have a story they've never been honest with about themselves. Because when you allow your sin in your past, when you allow what you've done to other people to loom large, and you face it, and you embrace it, and you offer it to God, it does something to your heart that softens your heart toward other people. In that moment, you are perfectly positioned to love the unlovable and to forgive the unforgivable. After all, you have freely received. Why would we not freely give? And my friends, that one idea changed the world one time. I think that one idea could change the world again. Last thing is this. Now, you're free to make restitution without expectations and without excuses. Now you're free to actually go to the people you've hurt. And instead of telling your sad story and instead of saying, well, you know, you were there too and you were part of it and the reason, no, 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 you're not gonna do that anymore. Now you're free to actually go to the people that you've taken something from because every time you hurt someone, you take something from them. Now you are free to go to them and you are able to give to them what you owe them, even if it's only words, even if it's a fall short of what you took from them. Now you are able to go to them without any excuses and without any stories. And do your best to make things right. Because your new covenant marching orders are to love as you have been loved. And if God humbled himself to send his son into this world to die for your sins, then why would we ever resist humbling ourselves by going to those that we've hurt? Let me tell you what Christianity is not. Christianity is not, I hurt you. And then I go over here and ask God to forgive me for hurting you. And then I just go on my merry way. That is not Christianity. I don't know what that is. Christianity is this. I hurt you. I realize I've hurt you. I ask God to forgive me. And then I come back to you to do everything I can to make it right. Why? Because the, my marching orders as a Christian and your marching orders as a Christian is to love as Christ loved us. And what did he do? 
do. He gave himself for us. And if perfect, innocent Jesus would give his life for you, who are we to withhold our lives from the people we have hurt? And here's the thing. Your efforts at restitution and your efforts at making an apology may actually unlock the vault of bitterness that's eating somebody else alive from the inside. It could be there's somebody from your past that you hurt and they don't know what to do with the hurt. There's somebody in your past that you really hurt and they've lived with it and they think you've gone on your merry way and you've started over and you're in a new city and maybe you have a new family and you got a new job and everything's fine for you and they are eaten up on the inside and they don't know what to do with it and they never expect to hear from you. And your willingness to humble yourself and go back and do your best to make restitution for what you did may be the very thing God uses to help them begin getting their heart right. So here's a terribly convicting question. Is somebody waiting for you to make the first move? And the reason you haven't made the first move is because you have told yourself a story for years that you're not really to blame. And you've hidden behind your story. And you're carrying your guilt that's undermining your own life. Meanwhile, you've left somebody else with a boatload of something they don't know what to do with either. Is somebody waiting for you to make the first move? Is there somebody from your past that would be shocked if they found out that you were a Christian and shocked if you showed up at their door to make things right? And is the only thing keeping you from doing that your pride? Is pride the boss of you? Jesus humbled himself for you, for me, is not following in his footsteps, doing that for the people we've offended and hurt. And when you do, even though you will be embarrassed, you will be free. And the weight of guilt will be lifted. And telling God you're sorry over and over and over and over again will never lift that weight. Because part of stepping into this relationship is submitting yourself to the lordship of Jesus Christ. And he says to you and he says to me, just as I love you, I love her. And you are the key to unlocking her heart, her vault, his heart, his vault of bitterness. Now go do for them. What I've done for you. So, are you ready to stop with all the excuses? Are you ready to stop telling yourself those same old stories? And are you ready to get honest with God and maybe get honest with others? Are you ready to be relieved of the weight of guilt that you've carried? Our problem is, and I understand this, we fear the consequences of confession to other people more than we fear the consequences of concealment. That's a mistake. That just makes guilt and shame in the past the boss of you. So the way forward is simply this, to decide. My past, it might, it might uh, remind me, but my past will not define me. And I'm not afraid to be reminded because from now on, the reminder, my reminder of my past is gonna cause me to lift my eyes toward heaven and say, thank you, thank you, thank you. It's time for some of you to decide and to begin saying out loud day after day, guilt, you are not the boss of me. Guilt, you're not the boss of me. Guilt, you're not the boss of me. I'm not going to live out and pretend there's a story that's true that's not completely true. I'm going to quit telling that story because guilt, you're not the boss of me. And I'm not afraid for the reality to loom up large in front of me. I'm not afraid to embrace it. Guilt, you're not the boss of me. I'm not going to allow you to make me feel condemned for the rest of my life. I'm not going to define myself by what I've done. And if you have a hard time forgiving yourself, here's the best news of all. You can forgive yourself because your heavenly father says yourself has already been forgiven. God is simply waiting for you to step into it because there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because what the law could not do, God has already done. And he's inviting you, and he's inviting me to step into it. I don't know where this lands with you, and I know this is complicated, but I just pray you don't walk away and forget what you've heard. And I pray that you not live another day of your life carrying condemnation that Jesus chose to carry for you. 
Heavenly Father, this is so real and it's so heavy and it's so important. And I pray that in these next few minutes, you would give us the wisdom to know what to do and the courage to decide to do it. And Father, for the man or woman who for years has just defined themselves by their failure, I pray that in these next few minutes, they would find the words to say, it's yours. Father, for the person who just has never faced it, it's just terrifying, it's so painful, it's so embarrassing, I pray that they would bring it up, hand it to you, and go make things right with other people. But Father, however that works, I pray that we would be free because you paid such a high price to allow us to be free. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, in the comfort of your own home, on your iPhones, your laptops, whatever it may be, your Apple TVs, welcome. Sing with us, even at home. Come on, here we go. There is no end to your power. There is no limit in you. You break down the walls. You make giants fall. There's nothing that you cannot do. Yeah. So we will not fear, no. You are a strong defense. We stand in confidence. Our God unstoppable. Nothing's impossible. Here we go. Now fear will surrender to your love. The power of darkness undone. Face to face with death in the grave, Jesus our God overcomes. Oh, so we will not fear, no, oh, we will not fear. You move the mountains, you part the waters, you fight our battles, nothing's impossible. Corner. 
the stone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving sees my comforter.
surrender all we have to you. We pour out our praise to you. We lift you up. We magnify your name for you are the one with the answer. safety and comfort in that and we do and we love you so much we thank you we're excited about where you're taking us next because you have our attention <laughs> you have our attention we're listening and we're going to follow you in your name we pray amen I hope that was encouraging for you. That there is freedom on the other side of God's forgiveness for you. That that regardless of what you've experienced, that God's love, God's grace, God's mercy is enough. It's enough. All right. Thank you for being here with us this week. And we will see you again soon, hopefully. All right. Bye.